born and raised in Oakland, California, very urban, obviously. Um, we were in what we would consider to be a pretty bad neighborhood. You know, I mean, it got worse as I got older, but um, it was it was it was urban. It, it kept you on your feet. Let's put it that way. So I had a lot of energy. I needed to have a lot of energy to know how to walk the streets right, so I didn't get beat up every day. It was just every other day, but. Uh, I was always into music, though, ever since I was a kid. My dad had was into music, when, and, and, and he had tons of records. And so when he'd go to work, I'd be like five years old playing with my army men on the floor, but I'd have his records on in the background, and I'd cue them up, and I'd be listening to music, listening to music all day. It was always on, always listening to something in the background, always thinking about, you know, things in my head. You know, when I'd hear certain songs, I mean, I'd... I'd come up with scenarios and stuff. I was like, it, it meant a lot to me. My parents were very strict, so I couldn't go to Winterland. I couldn't go to the Fillmore like some of my other friends were doing when I was like 15 or 16. It took me a while. I got there eventually at 16. They said, okay, well, you can go to the Oakland Coliseum, but you know, you can only go with your friends and somebody's got to be at least, you know, 18 or whatever. And uh, the first show I ever saw live was at the Oakland Coliseum, and it was Credence Clearwater and Canned Heat <laughs> at the Oakland Coliseum. And not long after that, maybe within six months of that show, I saw Jimi Hendrix, and the opening act was the Chicago Transit Authority. They were on their very first tour. It was the original you know, Chicago, the original Chicago band, and they had Terry Kath on guitar just burning it up, and and it was absolutely awesome. I finally got to see the guy that I idolized, Jimi Hendrix, and then a year later I saw him uh, at the Berkeley Berkeley Community Theater, which he played two shows, and they made a movie out of it called Jimi and Berkeley, and uh, those were those were like some of the the the, the main things that I saw when I first started going to concerts. Obviously. You know, people are still freaking out when I talk about that. They go, you saw Jimi Hendrix, man? Yeah, I saw him twice. <laughs> uh, first record I ever bought, that would have been really young. Because, like I said, I, I was always into music ever since I could learn how to take the needle and stick it on top of a record. You know, I was doing it. Um, and so I remember I bought this album because I loved this single on the radio, and it was Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. <laughs> and uh, it was called The Lonely Bull, was the, was the name of, of the single. So it was this, you know, instrumental with him playing, you know, the horn, and uh, just by some weird coincidence, we ended up getting signed with A&M Records, which was his record company, along with Albert Moss. So. It's kind of a strange thing, and it was a cool cover. It was a, it was kind of a risque cover at the time. It, it had this woman in a bathtub, naked with bubbles, you know, covering all mm -hmm. of the, all of the parts that nobody wanted to see at that time. You know, the, it was probably the '50s or you know early '60s or something like that. But uh, that was my very first record. But my first rock record, I think, was uh, Iron Butterfly in Agata De Vida. <laughs> Wow, man! I remember being excited going down to Kresge's, which was kind of like a uh, Walmart, Kmart kind of thing, and they had you know all the records out there, man. Like, and, and I would look through the bins, man. Oh, cool! In a God of the all, gotta get that one, man. <laughs> so I was just like a happy boy, you know, riding back on my ten-speed home, you know, couldn't wait to put it on my record player. So at some point, I told my dad, "Wow, I want to play it." I want to play music, you know, I want to play an instrument. And the only instrument that I'd seen when I was in like third or fourth grade was my dad's brother was playing accordion. <laughs> and like all good Italian boys, you know, I thought, oh, this is cool, man, I'll play accordion. Um, yeah, that wasn't the instrument for me. It, it, was, it was total crap. I, I gave it up after about a year or so. And uh, that was early on. But Going to school, grade school, and uh, in early high school, it was all about the music of the 60s, and uh, which was pretty much kind of Motown stuff. And um, that's kind of what we were all b born and raised with at that time. 
that was the music. And, and then as, as the pop stuff started becoming more rock as well, then that was really interesting to me. And before I started playing guitar in high school, all of a sudden, all these other things started happening. The, the, what we call the British invasion of, of Deep Purple and Zeppelin and The Who and all these different people were all over the, the, the airwaves. And, uh, and I started listening to that. And, but before I got to that, it was all about Hendrix. I heard Hendrix for the first time, and that just stopped everything right there. I, I had to play guitar, and uh, I was so into it. So I'd have a little reel-to-reel um, -reel deck next to my bed, and I had it plugged into an AM-FM portable radio. So any time that the FM station would play anything cool that was like rocking and, and had a good guitar solo, I'd hit record, and I'd listen back to it, you know, and I'd get the idea, who are these guys, you know? And, and uh, eventually, I asked my dad, I said, when I was uh, just uh, in between sophomore and junior year of high school, I said, I want to get a guitar. Can, can, can I get a guitar, you know, a cheap one even, it doesn't matter. And he goes, no son, I paid for a hundred dollars for an accordion for you when you were in third grade and you know, I'm not gonna waste my money. And I said, all right, that's fine, I hear you. I said, but it's gonna be different, I feel it. I just feel something's gonna happen. So I uh, saved my paper out money <laughs> and I bought a Montgomery Ward's $27 Strat, Fender Strat copy. And, uh, and I never put the thing down. I'd come home from school every day, much to my parents' disappointment. Uh, I would do a little bit of my homework, but I would mostly have that thing in my hand from the time I got home from school until I went to bed. And I'd sit there and I'd watch TV and I'd play along with anything that was on TV, a commercial or anything. You know, I was just teaching myself basically how to play guitar. And so because I had such an, uh, a passion for it and I, I apparently had a knack for it, uh, it all started to happen pretty quickly. Uh, within a, about a, maybe a year and a half or so after playing guitar, I was already in a band and we were doing a few things locally. I got some other people that were interested in playing with me and eventually it turned out that I met Leonard Hayes uh, in about 1972 and I graduated from high school in 1972. <laughs> so it was literally right out of high school. We get in a band we start yesterday and today, which eventually becomes the band that I've been in for 43 years, y and I remember that we first got together, it, the whole idea was, of course, did we have the feeling that each other was the right person to be in the band with. He was the happening drummer in the area. I was one of these sort of happening guitar players that people were talking about at the time. Uh, just, and happening from the standpoint that all the all the parties that we would go to in the Oakland Hills or something like that, there was this sort of underground musician thing where people would show up and jam and, and people would talk about, hey man, did you hear about this kid from San Leandro or this kid from over here? He's really good guitar player. So it was that kind of a thing. It was just sort of a word of mouth, who was hot in the area kind of thing. So it eventually came around to the fact that Leonard and I were going to get together and, and, and jam and we're going to see what happens. And Everybody loved the whole feeling of our first jam together, and they invited me to join their band, which was just playing cover, cover tunes. So we played four hours worth of cover tunes, and uh, the first gig we played was, it was like some children's after school thing or something, and, and we're like, what are we doing here? I mean, this, is, this is totally wrong because we're playing cover tunes, you know, hit singles and stuff like that, but also deep tracks of stuff from like Mountain and ZZ Top and Zeppelin and all these different things too that we were throwing in there. And, but we did the gig and it was, it was you know, they, they gave us our, you know, 75 bucks or 150 bucks or whatever it was that they paid us for it. And we went along our way and we just, started getting gig after gig after gig, playing mostly Navy bases and apartment complexes and wedding receptions, doing what everybody does when they first start putting a band together. But after two years, uh, Leonard and I looked at each other and said, it's time to do our own thing. Let's, let's do it. And so we started writing together, just the two of us, 
and it became real obvious and painfully obvious to the other guys in the band at the time that that was not the direction they wanted to go. And they dropped off and we found two more guys that were wanting to do the same kind of music that we wanted to do, which was Phil Kenimore and Joey Alves. And we finalized the band in January of 1974 and never looked back. It was all original stuff from that, from there on out. We, we put out our own flyers and rented halls and put our own gigs on. Free kegger party, come on out. We'd oversell these things and we just started becoming the sort of Bay Area phenomenon, unsigned act. And, you know, within about probably two years of that time, we had our first record deal and we went along our way. We didn't really have too much going for us as far as uh, demo tapes went, so we put our money together and we went down to Freeway Recording Studio in Oakland and uh, made this four-song demo tape. And it was pretty raw. It was, in fact, it was really raw. But it gave us enough to have some kid that was really into helping us out. You know, oh, I'm going to get you something, man. Give me that demo tape. I'm going to take it to every manager and so on and so forth. So he goes to really the only really big management team in the Bay Area at that time, which was Herbie Herbert, Lou Bramey. And uh, Herbie had another band that he was just, that they just signed called Journey. And Herbie and Lou came out to see us. They never got to see us the first two times they tried to see us because the, the gigs that we put on were so crazy and oversold that the police shut them down before we got on stage. So finally, when they did get to see us, they were freaked out. They, they were like, wow, you know, this, there's, these kids are young, crazy, totally over the top, but this is, this is something we should look into. So uh, a couple of months later, we signed with them, and it was us and Journey, and we played probably 30, 20, 30 shows together, just Journey and Y&T, and uh, they pulled us out of the ashes and uh, started getting us in with Bill Graham playing shows, opening up for major artists, even though we had not had a record deal yet. They pulled a few strings, and we played with Queen, uh, one time in San Francisco, and it was Queen, Mahogany Rush, and Yesterday and Today. And the next year, we play with Queen again at the Berkeley, Berkeley Community Theater from the Night at the Opera Tour. And we play two shows with them, and it's just Queen and, and Yesterday and Today. And the uh, president of London Records happens to be in the audience, sees us. He was invited there, of course, by our manager, and uh, said, yeah. Let's, let's do it. So we signed with London Records, and it was a mistake at the end of the day because they were the wrong record company for us, but that was the beginning of at least making records. Once we got that record deal, uh, we started playing more and more often in Southern California. In fact, Herbie brought us down to Southern California to do our very first show in Southern California before we had the record deal, and he goes, I got you this gig, man, because I know this promoter from working with you know, all these other artists that he had worked with before just being a, a, a stage tech, you know, or whatever, a road manager or something like that. So he got us this gig opening up for Kiss and Jojo Gunn at the Santa Monica Civic. And we didn't have a record deal. Nobody knew who we were. And Kiss was just starting their first headline tour. That was their very first tour in, in you know, coming through Southern California. And we had heard about them, but we didn't know much about it. But anyway, we played the show, and it went over like gangbusters as far as the, the fans were concerned. They, they were like, who are these guys? There was started to get a bit of a vibe happening. So that got us into them saying, hey, why don't you guys come back? And uh, so we go back with Herbie and Journey now, and we play this place called the Starwood. And great, great club. I mean, that was the club to play in the 70s and, and the early 80s. That's where everybody was basically seeing bands that were up and coming and becoming bands because of that to some degree from being in, you know influenced by the bands they were seeing. And so uh, we did that and within about a year's time we became the darlings of Southern California after we finished that first record and we're headlining the Starwood now and we're playing two shows a night 
three shows on the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and selling out every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I can tell you that almost every single band that ever came out of L.A., no matter how big they are or how medium or small, they all saw us at the Starwood at some point or another as they were trying to get their shit together to be a musician. And it was like a freaky thing, man. I mean, even bands 20 or 30 years later that we had never met and we played some, some festival with them, Sure enough, somebody in that band came up to us and said, man, I used to see you at the Starwood. I was a young kid, man, and you influenced me, you know. And it was just like so many different people. Guys from Metallica, guys from Rat, the guys from Motley Crue from, you know, I mean, Motley Crue's first show was opening for Y&T at the Starwood, their very first show in L.A. Um, Van Halen opened up for us at the Starwood and a few other places in Southern California. It was that kind of a thing. It was the place to play and it was the place to be seen and to see, so, you know, the, the up and coming guys. So it was, it was such an amazing trip. We were down there a lot and we spent a lot of time down there trying, of course, to get other record companies to be interested in us after London Records went south because they they, you know, didn't want pop music. They didn't want rock music anymore. They wanted to sort of expunge their entire uh, artists of that and uh, just go with classical and popular music, which was a totally different thing, like Engelbert Humperdinck or, you know, Tom Jones or something. So uh, we were not the right fit for them. So we would go back to L.A. and play the Starwood and play a few other places down there. Uh, there was the Canyon Club. Uh, there were, uh, you know, a couple of other venues that were the hot places to play. And, of course, we would be waiting for record company execs to hopefully show up into that balcony at the Starwood and maybe be interested in signing us. And eventually it did happen. We went with A&M in 81.